Welcome to Greenhouse Grower to Grower, the podcast where we talk to growers from across the greenhouse industry about market trends, innovation, their biggest challenges and opportunities, and more. I'm Brian Sparks, editor of Greenhouse Grower. Hello, everyone. By the time you listen to this podcast, we will be about a month or so removed from Cultivate 2024, where we had our entire Greenhouse Grower team down in Columbus for a long few days of education and walking the trade show floor and a lot of other special events and activities that that were taking place at the event. So um, it's always an action-packed show. And so we wanted to use this as another opportunity for our team to kind of talk about our own experiences at the show, what were some of our biggest experiences and takeaways from it. So I am joined today again by Greenhouse Grower Senior Editor, Julie Hewlett. Um, And I'm actually going to let Julie start talking right away with what kicked off this year's Cultivate. And that was uh, one of the tours. In this case, it was a tour of local greenhouse operations. So Julie, first of all, thanks for uh, joining me on on the podcast today. Oh, thanks, Brian. I always enjoy being a guest on Grower to Grower. (laughs) So you got a chance to do the tour. So can you kind of talk about where you guys went and and, and some of the highlights? Yeah, this was a good trip. I mean, they're all I've, I've gone on the greenhouse tour every year. So the last three years at Cultivate and they're all really good experiences for a couple of reasons. One is that you just get to go into the operations and see how everything works. You get to see the crops that they're growing, the production challenges that they're facing. You get to you know, meet face-to-face the people that are doing all of this work, which is really helpful to me because I feel like you can only learn so much about horticulture by sitting in an office and writing about it and talking to people on the phone. So I always take advantage of those opportunities to go do tours and meet people in person. But I have to say, um, probably the highlight for me this year was listening to Dan Johnston, one of the co-owners of Tri-State Foliage. We went out to the Cincinnati area for the tour this year. And I just love finding people who are clearly passionate about horticulture and the work that they do and making their business thrive and just hearing them um, talk about kind of what their best practices are and things that they've learned over the years, especially someone like him who's been in the industry for so long. He said that he started at Kruger Maddox, and mm-hmm. we went to visit them on the tour as well. Um, but he he was just interesting to listen to some of his business practices. Dan was telling us that he goes down to Florida every six weeks throughout the year to look for new varieties. They always want to have a very diverse portfolio of products. Um, So he said that he likes to go down in person and see what the choices are, but he also likes to build those relationships so that you're not just talking to someone on the phone and you're not just emailing with somebody that if, if he receives product that isn't quite the quality that he's used to or what he's looking for he knows the people and he knows that they'll expect to see him again in six weeks if (laughs) there are any problems which i thought was hilarious because that's such a good idea just to know people as friends as colleagues and build that relationship so that you kind of trust each other and you know what the other one expects in terms of good quality So I liked hearing about that from him. Mm -hmm. And then, like I mentioned, they focus on having a diverse portfolio of products. And he said that when they have a semi that goes down to Florida to all these different nurseries to pick up, you know, different different varieties, he said that that semi makes about 30 different stops to fill up the truck. And that's crazy to me. I mean, we all know how expensive, you know, transportation is. Anything related to logistics can quickly turn into a debacle. Um, and I thought that it was a little bit easier for growers to have the the least number of stops possible. Yeah. But they're so invested in having those really unique, rare varieties, things that you won't find anywhere else, that they're willing to make 30 different stops to fill up a truck. I mean, that just shows the, the dedication that he has to his business, but also that the business has to their customers. So I that was one of my favorite things that I learned during the greenhouse tour. Just a couple quick tidbits from Dan. And he's a character just just to hear him address <laughs> the tour group. He has a lot of energy. He is more than willing to share his hot takes. It was great. So I, I really enjoyed that for sure. Oh, nice. Nice. And it's kind of funny. So while you were on the tour, so I, I was in some of the classrooms and, you know, you mentioned there just building relationships. And that was one of the, the points in, in a really interesting panel discussion that I was able to attend, and it was all about, 
improving employee engagement uh, at your company. You know, nowadays when you see a lot of people moving jobs, you know, whether it's in and out of the industry or, you know, there's, there's a lot more competition and making sure that you can retain your workforce. So that there was a, a nice group that got together, kind of talk about, you know, some of their different employee engagement strategies. Uh, the panel is moderated by Todd Downing, uh, Best Human Capital. Um, but it was a group of growers on the panel, Susie Raker with Raker Roberta's Young Plants, Mike Valevsky at Dan and Jerry's Greenhouses, and then also on the breeding side, Dana Valley, who does Head of Human Resources of, of the Americas at Doom and Orange. So really interesting discussion there. A couple of the things that they talked about that really stood out to me the most, there was a discussion on, on benefits. And, you know, what are some of the new types of benefits that are being offered, you know, by, uh, by different companies? Anything from, you know... Uh, pet insurance to legal help, you know, if, if, if you're somebody in your team is going through, you know, a divorce or just other challenge, uh, personal challenges that they have to, that they have to navigate through having some, some different options for them. Um, you, they talked about how to manage your team when, if you've got multiple locations and kind of making sure that, okay, you know, we're, we might, we, we, our headquarters might be in one area, but we want to make sure that, you know, our team across all locations is engaged and treating everybody the same way. Um, you know, we talked about different training or excuse me, they talked about different training and development programs and the fact that you don't want to necessarily have a one-off once a year conversation with somebody in your team. The engaged employee is going to be the one that can, that can trust you and to come to you when there's challenges, and you can help facilitate that trust by having regular conversations, not just about work either, but also about you know a, a personal life. You really get to, to get to know an employee; they're going to um, become much more trusting uh, of both you and your business. Um, you know, this industry obviously changes very quickly, so that was another topic of discussion: is you know how, how to help your employees navigate through. You know, times have changed. Obviously, you know during the COVID-19 pandemic, that was a big thing too. But then things like ownership changes um, or company acquisitions, making sure that, um, you know, you're transparent with your employees at all times. Susie Raker talked about this quite a bit. You know, um, Raker's was bought a few years ago by Roberta. So she talked about, you know, being as transparent as, as possible during that process and keeping an open door communication policy at all times. So, you know, and, and again, it's one of those things and I've talked about this a lot before where, you know, you go to a show like Cultivate and it's, and it's nice to see, you know, crowded rooms talking about things like new technology and new varieties. But when you have discussions about, you know, these more, I'll say higher level topics uh, that will affect the long-term future, not just of these businesses, but of the industry as a whole, to really have the engagement from from the uh, the audience for that was uh, was really interesting. So um, just the, one of the ways that I spent my Saturday. So um, Julia, another th I know another thing that you were able to attend one of the special events was the Women in Horticulture lunch. Can you kind of talk about your perspective from that? Yes, the Women in Horticulture lunch was fabulous as always. Um, I was especially excited this year because I knew and have worked with the, the guest speaker before. It was Geneva McNeil, the owner of GLM Leadership Consulting. And I believe we met at Cultivate about two years ago. It was my first Cultivate. And um, at the time, she was working as a training and development manager with Metro Line of Greenhouses. And since then, she decided to start her own like consulting firm and work with workforces and individuals to figure out what is the best leadership style, how can you professionally develop to be the best leader within your company, things like that. So when I saw that she was announced to be the Women in Hort speaker this year, I was very excited because we've collaborated on a number of different articles over the years. And her speech, what I thought was very engaging with the audience, but also brought kind of a unique perspective to the event. You know, obviously Cultivate is about horticulture and it's about plants and so many of the conversations at the show are about that and they should be. But uh, Geneva took a little bit of a different approach. She, during her speech, she was talking a little bit about having self-doubt about your career or things going on in your personal life and how you can overcome those fears. Um, even if you're a little bit of a trailblazer, like if you're a grower at an operation and there hasn't been a female grower before, or you're the first female that's taking on a leadership role within your company, something along those lines. She talked a lot about that and just steps that you can take to make sure that 
you have a good path and that you're confident for the goal that you're trying to achieve and how others can support you, both men and women around you, just your peers in general, how you can all support each other. And I heard a lot of people talking about that because, you know, I left around lunchtime and then you go around the show floor and you see people out and about and you just talk about, hey, what's new at Cultivate? What have you learned? What have you heard so far? And a lot of people had such strong takeaways from the things that Geneva said during the Women in Hort lunch. And they were saying, you know, that personal story that she shared, that really resonated with me. I've had the same experience. I felt the same way, but I feel so much more motivated now and supported now to go chase whatever my dreams are and make sure that I'm confident in doing so. And if there's a glass ceiling to break, then I'm ready to shatter it. And I know I saw Geneva a little bit later at our um, Evening of Excellence, which we'll talk about later in the podcast episode. And she was like, oh, I don't know how, you know, how the luncheon went. Like, I was a little bit nervous. And I was so happy to tell her that I have heard nothing but wonderful feedback about that. And I think that I always like making connections with people, not just, the, you know, who you're emailing for sources for an article or people that you see at a trade show, but like what relationship can you make on a personal level so that when you see each other at the next show and the next cast and everything, um, you're, you're really building more of a friendship rather than just being business associates, if that makes sense. And I think that Geneva and I have built that. And I think that she helped build that with a lot of other people in the room during that Women in Hort lunch. So I really enjoyed that. I think that there were some good takeaways from that. Um, so thanks for asking. I'm always happy to talk about it. <laughs> oh, sure. Sure. Absolutely. Um, you know, an another, uh, I don't even want to call it a trend, but something I was hearing a lot more about, and there were a couple of discussions devoted to the topic was, you know, when it comes to emerging technology and the use of artificial intelligence, you know, there's still a lot of lingering questions over, you know, okay, so what does this actually mean for my business? How can I incorporate it into you know, our, our day-to-day -day operations and in some, into some of our long-term planning in a way that doesn't kind of scare off or intimidate some of our employees, maybe wondering, okay, how is this going to affect, you know, what I'm doing in the long-term? And the general general theme, you know, throughout most of the discussions that I heard on that, and you'll see more of this in future articles on greenhousegoer.com, was that, you know, technology like AI is, is not here, and, and you, hear, you hear this a lot, you know, as, as various automation systems are being introduced. It's not about taking jobs away in this industry. What it's about is helping you as a company and all of your team become more efficient and using technology in the processes that, you know, can, can take a lot of physical labor in, in using automation and AI tools to, to take over that process in a much quicker way that you can then begin to move your employees to other areas where they're most needed. And some of the growers who are on the, a couple of the panels that, uh, that I was in, uh, listening to talked about communicating that to their teams and, you know, as they implemented this technology, the reaction they were getting from their teams was, you're absolutely right. You know, this is, you know, this is making my job much more efficient. It's, me, it's allowing me to do things that I am and, and much more interested in. So, again, watch for more information on that in, in future content on greenhousegrower.com. And, you know, we'll have some upcoming episodes here where we talk to some of the growers who are part of, you know, a few of those discussions. In fact, I know that the, the second wave of the Horticulture Research Institute's uh, new leadership class did a whole project project about implementation of AI. So that's something that you can watch more of here in the near future. You know, speaking of emerging technology, you know, Julie, going back to you, uh, if we, we see all the headlines about these glow in the dark petunias and we got to see them, well, see as much as you could up close because you're walking into a dark room, but I'll let you talk more about that, Julie. Yes, like I, like I said earlier, I always ask people like, what's going on? What have you heard? What's especially interesting at the show? And when somebody told me that there was a glow in the dark petunia, I was like, shut up. No, there is not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought that it sounded so cool. So obviously I ran myself over to whatever room it was, B152 something to find this glow in the dark petunia. And it was so cool. I'm glad that they told me at the beginning, when, like before you came in, they said to give it a few minutes, let your eyes adjust because you won't be able to see anything. Because y'all know, sometimes I'm just like short, <laughs> short tempered. And if I would have gone in and I didn't see anything and be like, okay, I'm out. 
but <laughs> I'm glad that I did not do that because it did. It took a few minutes for your eyes to adjust. When you went into this conference room, it was completely dark. Um, it was a little bit of like a weird feeling kind of because there were people talking to you. Like you knew that there were other people in the room, but you couldn't see anything. And I was like, this is a little odd. Like, who are you? <laughs> um, but it was cool. They had some some red lined, like the floors were lined with these little red lights along the edges just to make sure that people didn't like bump into the wall when they were walking around. And then there was a table in the center that had all the petunias on them. And in daylight, they're they're white. They just look like normal white petunias. Um, but as your eyes adjusted, you sure enough could see like that they were glowing, kind of this green color. And I saw it more on the buds, but you could also see it with like the flowers that were open and then on the leaves a little bit as well. It's from that company Light Bio and it's like a bioluminescent. And I was just so surprised, not to say that I didn't believe them at the beginning, but you know, there's always like things that people are chattering about. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'm going to go see it for myself. But it was true. And then I think after that, I went to tell pretty much everybody else that I saw at Cultivate. I was like, did y'all see the glow in the dark petunia yet? Like I was spreading the word rapidly. <laughs> um, and I believe Raker Roberta's is the one that's growing those petunias at the moment. And I think Moss Greenhouses had something to do with it, too. Maybe they had held like a retail event for consumers or something at their greenhouse. Yeah. I know, yeah, the two of them have been working on it with um, Light Bio. But that was definitely a highlight for me. I thought that that was really cool. It's obviously not something that you see very often and something that has enough of like a value proposition that consumers are going to be really interested in it. So I thought that that was pretty cool. That was exciting to see. Well, and you want to talk about a highlight and you, you'll forgive me, Julie, I didn't tell you before and that I was going to mention this, but if you saw somebody on Sunday evening running around frantically from, from one <laughs> building to another in downtown Columbus, that would have been Julie. So as a lot of you know, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, receptions and social hours and cocktail hours that take place uh, it, after hours at Cultivate. A lot of them take place on Sunday night. So what, what our team generally does is, is we put together a list of, of here's all the receptions that are going on and we kind of divide and conquer to make sure that, you know, we can uh, connect with as many folks as we can. So as we're going through this whole list, Julie's like, okay, I'm going to go to this. I'm going to go to this. I'm going to go to this. And we kept telling her, Julie, you're never going to make all these. Two hours later, I saw her. She was just leaving her fourth uh, reception on her way to her fifth. And sure enough, she made it to one more after that. So um, <laughs> if I don't ever... I, I will never doubt again Julie's uh, promises to attend as many things as she possibly can at one time. So had to share that detail. Um, well, that's mostly why I wanted to do it because y'all yeah. didn't think that I could. So I needed to prove you wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I want to go back to a couple more of the presentations that I was, that I was able to sit in on. Um, one was, you know, we did a few earlier podcast episodes on this. So there's a, a, a gathering of university horticulture department chairs that meets on an annual basis in different areas of the country. So this year they had planned to meet in Columbus and it timed right up really well with Cultivate. So what what they decided they were going to do was put together a panel discussion with about six different university de uh, department chairs represented to kind of talk about trends and enrollment, how they're getting more younger people engaged in horticulture and then kind of preparing them for careers once that once that once they get out of school. And our July cover story of Greenhouse Grower talked a lot about, about this. And there was a, a, an interesting follow up discussion you know, kind of that, that kind of took place with some of these department chairs sharing ideas over here, some of the new programs that we've put in place to engage students more. Um, sometimes it's not even necessarily about floriculture. I know, you know, we, we talk about the emergence of the CEA market and I'll just bring up one example. So Desmond Lane, uh, who's, who's a longtime friend of mine at the University of Auburn, um, it works with a lot of culinary students where they can come up with different recipes based on food that can be grown indoors. Um, you, again, you can watch for a future article on, on that uh, on greenhousegrower.com, but that was a really interesting discussion. And then later in the day on Monday, um, we Greenhouse Growers partnered with Best Human Capital on a succession planning survey to kind of look at, you know, where we stand as an industry and how we can benchmark against ourselves um, on whether we have, you know, a plan in place to 
because I mean, a lot of the, biz the businesses in this industry are, are multi-generational family-run businesses. How can we transition our businesses to the next generation? How can we develop an exit plan uh, so the grower can, can build the business so that's profitable when it when it eventually goes on to the next person? So um, they the Best Human Capital recently put together a survey on this, and they shared the initial results from the survey at the event. And, you know, again, we'll have more coverage on that and, you know, what, what, what the survey really said in future issues of Greenhouse Grower and, and on the website as well. So, um, Julie, I'll, I'll go back to you one more time to talk about, you know, we, sustainability is a big word in the industry as, as it has been for a long time. And I know, I know you wanted to, to talk about that a little bit, what some, of, what some of the things you were hearing when it comes to what's happening with sustainability in the industry. Yeah, there were just a lot of people that I spoke with that were either working on new sustainability initiatives or just thinking about conceptually, what can we do? How can we be better? How can we reduce our input use? Things like fertilizers. Um, how can we reduce our plastic use? And I'll bring up, bring up a couple of examples that you guys can look for as well in the September issue of the magazine. But when I was talking to the representatives from Smurf at West Rock, they brought up their new brand, Phoenix, that's focused on bio-based products for tags. And I have a couple on my desk right now. They have um, some for nursery tags and some products for locking tags that are like bio-based, plant-based materials. And that was a big initiative of theirs just to make a, products that are more environmentally friendly, things that reduce the carbon footprint, things like that. And then I heard similar comments from Proven Winners. You know, they have their um, pots and some that are recycled plastic and then some that are plant-based from like corn sugars. And they have the same for tags as well, re recycled plastic tags and uh, plant-based tags. And they've t they both, Smurf at West Rock and Proven Winners said the same thing, that they've just heard a lot of feedback from their customers, from the industry as a whole, that we call ourselves the green industry, but how can we actually be greener? Like what changes mm -hmm. can we make to have less of an environmental impact, less of a carbon footprint? People don't like it. Uh, consumers don't like taking part in a hobby that, has a lot of waste like they don't like buying plants and then having all these leftover plastic pots that you just have to throw away and they're not right. even the type of plastic that could be recycled even if the consumer wanted to do that and that's one thing the proven winners was mentioning too with their eco pots is that they can be planted in the soil like in the landscape with the plant in it and it just breaks down over time and then the pot also has nutrients like built into it that will be released into the soil that the plant can can take up so I just heard a lot of things like that, too. I know we stopped at the MPS booth for a little while as well. And yeah. they seem to be having, you know, good feedback from their grower partners, as well as more people that are interested in that certification program as they're looking to for ways to make their operation more sustainable. And it, it's not always just a matter of, oh, we should be more sustainable because that's the right thing to do. When you look into it, a lot of times it's less expensive too. If you're using, you know, less inputs and things like that, or if you can reduce your water use, um, it is beneficial to the operations bottom line too. So that was, I feel like that was a good trend to see it cultivate. I heard a lot about that. And I think that people are making positive changes. Oh, that's awesome. And, and then I think if we want to close just, you know, by looking back at, you know, at least for us, I know, because it's the culmination of a lot of, of months of hard work, but it's our evening of excellence program. Um, you know, we, this is our chance to celebrate excellence and greatness across the industry. So we were able to present a, a number of our awards at our evening of, uh, evening of excellence reception, um, head grower of the year, operation of the year. Uh, technology of the year and I know Julie you're involved in a lot of a lot of the variety awards um, it's always great to be able to see you know so many innovators and leaders in the industry come together in one place to be able to recognize some of their peers for some of the great things that they're doing and you know what really touched me is as we get closer to the end of the night um, our last our, our last award that we present is our head grower of the year award and it's always been kind of one of my favorites because you know it's not necessarily about a company it's not about a product or a technology what i mean that's that, that's all great of course but it's about recognizing one person who 
can show, you know, passion for what they're doing. And that passion can then extend to leadership across the industry. This year, we were a fortune to be able to present that award to Tom Castamagna of Young's Plant Farm. And uh, you'll learn more about Tom. Uh, we'll do a, a longer profile on him for one of our upcoming issues. Um, but, you know, just, you know, again, being able to, to, to not only just see and, and spend time with friends across the industry, but to be able to, you know, celebrate, you know, excellence across the industry. Julie, any thoughts on this year's Evening of Excellence? Yeah, the Evening of Excellence, I thought it went really well. Um, we had good attendance, which we're always happy to see so many people there, so many of our colleagues and friends from the industry. But one thing that really stood out to me that I thought was fabulous was just the enthusiasm that people have when they're like a finalist for an award. Like Brian mentioned, I do the, the Variety Awards and I help with the Industry Achievement Award. And as soon as the doors opened, you know, I walk around and I just welcome people, greet people, like talk to some people that I know. And um, I saw that some of the breeding companies had brought like like little props kind of for their finalist plants. Like I saw a table of Doom and Orange reps sitting in the corner and they had, I, I don't know what to call them. They look kind of like badminton rackets. Um, but they had these that were like white and orange colored and it had the, the Duman logo on it. So, you know, when we announced their plant as a finalist, they're cheering and they have all their rackets in the air. And I thought that was really cool. And then um, we had a finalist plant from Syngenta as well, the new Sunfinity double yellow sunflower. And when I was walking around, I saw a Sunfinity double sitting on the table where all the Syngenta team was sitting so I just love seeing people do things like that because that's that's really the point of the event. Like we're there to celebrate all these wonderful plants, people, companies that are contributing to the industry, making strides and making new achievements every year. And we're there to have a good time. We have appetizers and drinks and <laughs> it's supposed to be fun. So like bring all your enthusiasm and your props and we're ready to have a good time. And I think we're fully expecting next year to for somebody to up the game even more by bringing in, I don't even know what they're called, but there's those giant heads that you see sometimes at, at stadiums. So next year. Yes, I've when, seen when, those. Exactly. So when, <laughs> so when we come around to this next year, I'm hoping that at least one of our finalists is going to have a, a, a prop like that. But um, anyway, so yeah. So, I mean, just e Evening of Excellence was a great way to just cap off, you know, a, a, a great few days at Cultivate. Um, you know, we're still kind of catching our breaths ourselves. And I'm sure many of you are who would, who attended the event kind of going through, you know, your notes and all the discussions you had and all the, all the, the new faces that you're able to meet and the, and the connections you're able to, you know, make along the way. And so, you know, just continue to watch Greenhouse Grower, our website, um, our, all of our social media platforms for just more information on what we saw from the event and encourage you also as well to, you know, those of you who has some, experiences some cultivate that you want to share with us just reach out to either julie or i and let us know um you know we love to share some of your key takeaways your key insights from cultivate with our audience so um julie thanks again for uh, joining me today and um we'll uh we'll, we'll we'll keep plowing ahead on greenhouse grower thanks for having me brian thanks for joining us you can learn more at greenhousegrower.com please subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen and please leave us a rating as it helps other podcast listeners find the show.